There's a deep need in every one of us to have a parent who deeply loves us. Where they are is where we derived the feeling of home. And sometimes as we grow up and go out on our own, when times get rough, the love of that parent and the existence of that place provides an anchor, a shelter where we can return for comfort and strength. So many of us with childhood PTSD suffer with a vague sense of emotional homelessness, either because we lost that parent too soon or we never had them in the first place. My letter today is from a woman I'll call Elizabeth, and she writes, Dear Anna, I'm 23 years old and recently ended an on and off again relationship that lasted two to three years. He was the first man I opened up to and dated. It was a long distance relationship. Although we never met in person, I was very attached to him. All right, I've got my fairy pencil. It matches my shirt today. I'm going to go through and circle things I want to come back to on a second reading. But let's just go through and see what Elizabeth is, is experiencing and see if I can help. All right. So she was very attached to this guy. When we broke off contact, I felt miserable and I knew I needed professional help. I've been going to therapy ever since. And a side note, I always was the one who broke off contact and sought it again. And almost everything mentioned in your videos applies to me. I suspect it has to do with the sudden absence of my aunt when I was a child. After my mother gave birth to me, my father avoided us for a while. I don't have a good relationship with my father to this day. And due to complications in childbirth, my mother became ill and my aunt took care of me. Since then, she was literally like a mother to me. The aunt. When I felt alone or unloved, I remembered that I had my auntie. I thought she would always have my back. I could turn to her and experience her unconditional love. She always used to buy me gifts and spoil me a lot. People admired our bond. When I was about three or four years old, my aunt got married and she went abroad and I did not understand what was going on. She was suddenly gone and nobody talked about her. They kept it secret from me because I might get hurt. I got used to her absence. After, I think, one year, she came back for the first time. My family wanted to surprise me and the doorbell rang and I saw my, I saw my auntie. My mother described the moment as follows. You completely froze and then ran away to hide <laughs> from her. And years later, she had her own children, and I often stayed with them as if I were their big sister. But soon I realized that there was no more room for me because my mother and many other family members told me to give my aunt space for her own children and that my home was with my parents. Once I had a breakdown at home and couldn't stop crying, I kept saying that I wanted to go and stay with my aunt, and my father slapped me in the face. I spoke to my aunt on the phone. I think she agreed to pick me up, and when she heard I wasn't feeling well, but my parents kept saying I wasn't allowed to do that and that I had to stop. That was probably the first time I understood the whole situation. My aunt is not my mother. She has her own life now and can't rely on, I can't rely on her anymore. I hated my home. I didn't feel loved, and I had the feeling that nobody understood me. In my own family, I felt like a complete stranger. But that day, even my aunt started to feel like a stranger. I know that my aunt only did what needed to be done, and that she, like everyone else, had her own life. My question would be if it is possible to build up trauma of abandonment when it is the aunt's absence, yet the primary caregivers are still present. And can it be a cause of CPTSD? Thank you so much for taking the time to read and listen. Okay, Elizabeth, wow, this story really moved me. And um, it took me a while to get to your letter. It's been on my mind, and um, I wanted to respond. My heart really went out to you about that sense of emotional homelessness that you described so well. And um, so let's talk about what you told me here. So it starts out with a relationship story. You're 23. You recently ended an on again, off again relationship that had gone on for two or three years. And he was the first man you opened up to and dated. And it was a long distance relationship and you never met in person. I mean, you kind of gloss over that, 
But oh, Elizabeth, that is so telling that you, he's the first person you opened up to and you never even met him in person. Like meeting online is how people meet each other now, but oh my gosh, two or three years without any contact. I just see that there's a huge attachment wound sitting here, <laughs> sitting in your life right now. And sometimes when people have been wounded as you have, as we're gonna talk about in a minute, being really close to people who are in real life, who can hurt you in real life, who can, you know, where you create like interdependencies, it can be too much for a person. And there's a certain appeal to this online relationship. And still, I don't know, I don't, you didn't even tell me why you broke up over and over again and kept going back, but I can guess it, it didn't feel great to you. You weren't happy. I don't know why, but I can just, you know, there's just like five different reasons why anybody would ever be happy and in in unhappy in a relationship. I assume it was one of those. And then you kept going back to him because what often goes with an attachment wound is needing to hold people at arm's length, like keeping it, having only a long distance relationship. Um, and then breaking up, but then the attachment wound then kicks in and gives you abandonment melange every time you try to leave. And abandonment melange is this really helpful concept to know, and I just can totally see how what happened to you as a kid would have uh, generated that in you. So abandonment melange is for people who were abandoned as kids, which you were, you know, your, your dad split, your mom had to be hospitalized, you had to be with your aunt, and then you were abandoned again when you had to go back to your parents and then the sort of toggle of abandonment, abandonment, always activating that wound. So your nervous system really got a pummeling of, of abandonment. And so that makes it feel like this intense grief, panic, rage when um, the end of a relationship comes, even if it was you who ended it, it can bring on this like emotional cocktail of feelings that is so intense and so unbearable that you will put up with anything to get past that feeling. Going back to a relationship that clearly made you pretty unhappy or you wouldn't have kept leaving it. What happened to you was the sudden absence of your aunt when you were a kid. After your mother gave birth, your dad avoided the family for a while. Well, that's what the heck, that's terrible. And you don't have a good relationship with him to, his, to this day. And that's a really hard thing for anybody not to have a dad. Very hard. Um, and there's a certain way it affects girls growing up and would have, would very likely affect the way that you um, relate in a relationship with a man complications in childbirth, your mother was ill and your aunt had to take care of you. You know, something tells me that's a story. Complications in childbirth, like I had complications in childbirth, but I did not separate from my kids. I, ha I had to have 14 surgeries, it, you know, it was a whole like years of, up, you know, in and out of the hospital, but I would never have separated from my kids. So I'm just saying like, that sounds like the cover story of what it was. I remember I had a friend growing up and they always said, her mother had died, she slipped in the bathtub, and later, you know, sometimes like information comes to me and I'm like, no, I think that friend's mother took her own life. I think that was the terrible thing that happened there. And um, it sort of ended up happening in the next generation and that was the clue to me, like something had happened. It sounds like your mother, maybe she had postpartum depression, right? Where a parent had to take over, or, or I guess you know, grave medical injuries that would have taken years. I don't know. So your aunt had to take care of you, and since then she was literally like a mother to you. And I believe you. And that's what we do. We bond with the person who takes care of us. Whenever you were alone or unloved, um, that you had your auntie, and that and that she always had your back, and you could turn to her and experience her unconditional love. I'm so happy that you had unconditional love. I had it from my grandmother and I had it from my biological dad. I didn't get to be with him all the time, but I had it. And the older I get and the more I get past and get healed from all the other stuff in my childhood that was so terrible, just that I had unconditional love is so meaningful. And I know a lot of people watching this never had it. And um, that's what we're do doing here is healing it. So you lost the person who unconditionally loved you. And that happened to me too. My dad died. She used to buy you gifts and spoil you, which is appropriate for an auntie. And people admired the bond. Um, and I will say also, I had a special bond with a niece as well. And she lived with me for a spell um, when she was little. And then again, when she was in high school.
But when you were three or four years old, your aunt got married and she went abroad and you didn't understand and she was suddenly gone and nobody talked about her. So nobody told you, I guess they thought it was too much for you or you were too little or they couldn't. It just sounds like your parents, <laughs> it sounds like your bond with your aunt um, would bring up their own shame and guilt about not being good parents to you. That's kind of my impression of them. So you got used to her absence when she was gone. And then when you saw her, you ran away and hid. And that's normal. Actually, when kids see somebody they haven't seen in a long time, it's just intense and they run away and hide for the emotional wave that comes to them. So you froze, you ran away. And years later, um, she had her own children and you often stayed with them. They were your cousins, but it was like you were the big sister. How wonderful that must have been to have like one adult in your life who just loved you and you could be there. But then you realized there was no room for you because your mom and many of the family members told you to give her space for her own children. I don't know if that's how your aunt felt. I just keep thinking your parents were threatened, but you know, there is a natural order to things. And as parents, they, I'm assuming they, their intentions were good to say, come on, we got to step up and really be the parents here. It may not have gone as they hoped, but they took you away from your aunt. And then, um, so you had to be with them. When you cried, you couldn't stop crying. And you said, I want to go stay with my aunt. I understand that. And then your dad slapped you. And it sounds like that was a turning point in you. That was a trauma moment where how you really felt and what you really needed became punishment. You know, so you spoke to your aunt on the phone. She said she'd come and get you. I can just imagine the sort of conflict between your aunt and your parents about this, where they're like, don't you come get her. Stop interfering with our authority here. And it would be natural for parents to feel threatened by that. But the only thing is, is what happened was they abandoned you when you were little. And I, um, I, I, that's a very tough situation because of course you needed contact with your aunt and it wasn't best for you to be separated from her. And it was very complicated for the overall family dynamic. Okay. So she's not your mother. You realized she has her own life and you can't rely on her anymore. And you hated your home and you didn't feel loved and you had a feeling that nobody understood you. And maybe that's true. Your aunt is still alive, I presume, and I don't think this is the end of your relationship with your aunt because you are, you're 23 years old, so there is still time to be mentored and loved and mothered by your aunt, and I hope you maintain a relationship with her. Um, you felt like a stranger in your family. How awful that is. I'm so sorry. But that day, even your aunt started to feel like a stranger, maybe because she went along with it and you felt betrayed because you were too young to know that she had an obligation to honor your parents, you know, primacy in your life because that's the law, because that's just kind of the order of things. I know that um, she only did what needed to be done and that she had her own life. Yeah, I think I wouldn't interpret it too much as that she didn't want you. She had to honor what your parents wanted. And there was a time with my niece, I really would have wanted her to come live with me, but I could not interfere with her parents' right to decide that, right? My question would be if it's possible to build up trauma of abandonment when it's the aunt um, and the primary caregivers are still present. Yes, it is. It's possible to get complex PTSD from any kind of chronic ongoing stress. And it just sounds like that is what you had. Um, it doesn't have to be the parents. And sometimes people get into the comments and they're like, well, I don't know, you know, how could it be PTSD? Because my parents aren't just like the videos, but everybody's different. P complex PTSD arises because of exposure to chronic, ongoing, intense stress. It changes your neurology. When it happens when you're a kid, it has a certain pattern, a bunch of patterns that emerge that we have in common. So I'm really focused on that. That's what I have. But I also had adult traumas. You know, if people with adult traumas only are looking at this, stay here. If you relate to the symptoms, you're in the right place. I hope you get some validation from this, from, you know, my feedback for you. You've done nothing wrong. Your aunt is still around. Um, you will be loved. And it seems like really important that that attachment wound gets some love and attention from you so that as you do go forward and start to have romantic relationships again, it can be different this time, that you don't have to hold people at arm's length. You can let them in and be close and be unconditionally loved. Okay. If you're watching this, 
I have techniques if, for the emotions that come up when you're feeling grief, when you're feeling homeless, when you have to cope and keep going on when there's nowhere to go where people accept you unconditionally. It's called the daily practice. That's how I got through these periods of my life. It's free. It's a, it's a writing and a meditation technique, not just anything very specific. And you can learn and try these techniques in less than an hour. And there's 25 FAQ videos. And I even do free Zoom calls every couple of weeks to um, do the techniques together with everybody who shows up and answer questions about it. My life is dedicated to sharing this with people. And I, I, I hope you give it a try. If you like what I teach, you can download that course right here. And I will see you very soon.